Welcome to Corel Painter Sergeant vs. Master Course, an in-depth series where we will learn about the Sergeant vs. tool set and how to apply them on different subjects such as still life, portraiture, architecture and landscapes. Our classes will have a gradual level of complexity, from simple sketching to more advanced techniques. Whether you are a beginner or an advanced artist, you are welcome to stay with us. We believe there is something for everyone in this course. Hey, it's good to see you again. We have come to the second half of our course. You have done free sketches and both minimalist and complex studies. You have learned how to break down color, value and shape and you have learned how to break down the process to simpler, manageable parts all of that using many brushes of the sergeant set. In the second half of our course, we are going to sharpen our skills by continuing to use these basic frameworks from previous classes and applying them to different subjects, adding in a little extra every time. In this class, we are studying landscapes and I have three key points for you. 1. It's important to develop artistic sensibility regarding what to portray about a landscape. It can be a natural feature or a set of natural features from that place. It can be the weather in a particular day or how it behaves in a season of the year. It can be the changes in lighting, for example sun up, midday, afternoon, sundown, night, etc. It can be a special event for that place. For example, the arrival or departure of migratory birds, the reaping of crops, first flowers in spring, etc. Or it can be simply the amazing colors of that particular place and particular moment. 2. It's important to know how to portray the features or events or whatever it is you choose to portray. And that is the part where composition is involved. A great way to train your compositional skills is by learning photography and practicing layout. Read as many articles or books you can on the matter. The most basic and accessible point to start is the rule of thirds, if you know nothing else. 3. It is important to understand when portraying a landscape you are, in fact, portraying a character. Treat the landscape as if you are portraying a character by giving it what? Character. Think of ways you can evoke the viewer's attention to interact, to listen, to speak to your landscape, to make it a living organism of its own. Take a print screen of our subject. This is a random landscape in Norway's countryside that I took with my mobile phone during the late summer. As usual, um, I tried to make it look as close as possible to the natural lighting that I saw during that moment. In this study, we are using the oily water brush. And I propose that you work in thumbnail this time, to broaden and sharpen your skills. How are you going to do it? Find a one-to-one -one scale for your motif. Approach 1. You can resize the image to a very small size no taller than 550 pixels as a maximum size, working low resolution. You cannot zoom in during the process. Approach 2. You can do a high resolution size, but you zoom out considerably until it looks very small like a thumbnail and you do not zoom in at all in any part of the process. I took the second approach as I have to show you the process for this class. The fixed size you see on my capture is of 400 pixels tall by 960 wide. However, when doing studies for myself, I work with the first approach, always in low resolution and the exact size I want for the thumbnail to be. So to start this one, first we divide the image into different planes, from the furthest to the closest one to the viewer, and as in our previous classes, this is the order in which we are going to solve the study. Remember, do a drawing to help you as a guideline if you prefer. This time, I am not showing any brush mechanics, 
since this painting has such a very simple, very basic brushwork. In a case of a landscape like this, where lighting and weather conditions make the visibility very clear and we have a complexity of details, we are going to break down the process like in our previous classes. The first step is mapping the structure of the landscape, simply by finding the dominant color or the average color of each of its planes. I want this painting to be loose, so I have a brush size that is slightly big, which means the outlines and some of the shapes won't be defined. When we do the mapping, we immediately have the composition ready, and visually, we already have a great understanding of the subject itself. If you are an extreme minimalist artist, your work ends here. But if you are like me and you like to dive in the many interesting elements and textures of this capture, the next step is to work the gradient or color variations of the sky, which in this case are minimal. I do so by applying a couple of layers with flat colors, then lowering their opacity. Then, we can map the sky by painting the clouds in a very basic way. Lower the opacity of the brush this time, as this one doesn't blend with the underneath colors. I recommend when painting clouds with this brush, start with medium density, somewhere in the middle between the strongest and the lowest density. I'm working on a slightly different scale, so part of the sky is cropped for my painting. On purpose, I keep working with the big brush size, and sometimes I struggle to make my shapes. I am not a masochist, but I like keeping things challenging during some studies. After this first basic layer, we apply the denser parts of the clouds, and that is by simply um, doing a new layer with the same color value and brush opacity. You can go ahead and do one more layer to fill in the smaller parts with the brightest highlights, if you want your study to be more detailed. For mine, I want to keep it simple, so fewer values and very loose. Now, you can choose whether you work on the main gradients or shadows of the mountains. I go for the shadows, as they help me to map the area as well. Then I add some basic green gradients and a touch of grey-purple. I go for the mountain highlights, and here you can go by groups of perceived same color, for example, to make the process easier. I go a bit random. To finish the mountains, I add the last details and polish the remaining shadows.
We move on to the next plain, or the lake. It looks like a fjord, but it's in fact a lake. And here is basically just a long gradient. As you have noticed the colors we get out of this brush, they are very similar to pastel, thus sometimes you may struggle to match the brighter tones. Colors will come across as darker, desaturated, or when you go to the most saturated side of the color wheel, the threshold between desaturated and saturated is very compressed. On our next plane, the overall structure seems simpler visually. I will start with the dominant color on the trees and the houses further back and work on my and work my way closer. Then I do the overall shadows and I finish with the highlights. Next, we go to the yellow field. The color variation is so little that you can start with the lighter or darker tones. I go for the darker ones and I end this part with the highlights. Now, we finish the plane closest to the viewer, and here is basically some dabbing and dashes of colors, doing short quick strokes. I start with some shading for the greens, then the highlights, and then I finish the flowers. Last, I take a look at the work and see where I can add some finishing. In this case, I just want to make some details have a stronger color, so I set the brush to full opacity and I dab on these places. Regarding this brush, um, overall I find the colors less organic and more difficult to achieve a good nuance between warm and cold tones, as well as between saturated and desaturated and between light and dark values, but I find it absolutely fun how it turn out and work very similar to traditional pastels. Do you remember our third class, 
where we did a minimalist realism sketch and added a second option using another brush to give the work a more painterly twist. Well, let's do the same here. Let's make a second version of this work with a slightly impressionistic twist using the drippy jellyfish brush. Save it as a different file, flatten the layers, open a new layer. Make a brush size that's neither too small or too big. Then use the color picker and get the main color of the clouds. Now start painting over the clouds and you may see some slight texture change, but not very obvious in this value. The real magic happens when you use the color picker to get the darkest blue of your sky gradient and you paint over those areas. Remember to vary your movements for a more natural brushwork. Then you go to the lighter tones of your gradients and you fill the rest of the sky. Done that, you can open a new layer and start color picking at the mountains and painting over. For this area with more details and color variations, you can make your brush slightly smaller but still big enough to make the brushwork look very loose. Then you can make a new layer for the lake and repeat the process. Moving to a new layer, the green field and the trees, then move on to the yellow field and last, the flowers. Now flatten all your drippy jellyfish layers. Now you can decide if you keep the effect as it is or if you want to make it stronger by duplicating the layer. If you are like me, you can lower the opacity to about half and have a more subtle effect. We have come to the end of our fifth class and you have learned one of many approaches to painting landscapes by giving it a loose, pastel look and also a second version, a twist of impressionism. You can also experiment applying any of the previous techniques you have learned in this master course to paint your landscapes. On our next class you will learn a new technique and we will study architecture. Thank you so much for watching. Corel Painter and I hope this class has been helpful to you. Stay creative, stay positive and inspired.